Welcome to Bible study. This is the Bible study I'm preparing for October 22nd. On October 15th, uh, we won't have uh, an adult Bible study. Uh, we have a vicar coming to preach for us, and uh, uh, so we're not going to burden him with both a Bible study and with a, uh, with a sermon that day. But on the 22nd, uh, Norm Metzler is going to be leading us, and I encourage you to come. Uh, Norm has some very interesting things to say, uh, and we look forward to hearing what he has to say. We'll be looking at chapter 3 of Acts on that day. It's a really interesting story. We've already looked at part of it, and last week we looked at how Peter's conversation with his, uh, with this lame man was really groundbreaking, and it was an exemplar of the new world, the new society, the new, the new human interaction, which Luke was describing uh, at the end of chapter 2, where he said that, that uh, they, they had everything in common, that, they were, that, that the wealthy were selling things and helping the poor, that they were breaking their bread together in their homes with glad and generous hearts. Peter, entering the temple, encounters that lame man. And he sees him, and he talks to him, and he heals him. But Luke always has more than one thing going on with these texts. He's not just telling us about how this new Christian society looks. He also is telling us an awful lot about Jesus. Several weeks ago, when we looked at the story of the ascension of Jesus, we saw the image of our Lord ascending into heaven and his disciples gathered around him. They saw him and the disciples were suddenly greeted by two men who stood by them and said, why do you look up into the sky? The same Jesus will come again, just as you've seen him depart. I think that little scene prompts us to ask a question of ourselves. Where did he go? I mean, the conclusion is, well, up into the sky, but where is that? Where is Jesus? Where do we find him now? If we were to look for him, where would we see? I think it's a rather childish notion to say that he's up in the sky, sitting on a cloud somewhere. Obviously, our telescopes and our uh, spacecraft have gone up there and haven't found him yet. I think Luke is actually answering the question. And he's starting to answer it right now. For... Jesus has given us many clues within his text. At the end of Matthew, he said, you know, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In the gospel, according to John, he said that you would do greater things than I will do and because I will abide with you and you will abide with me. And as the Father and I are one, so I will be with you. I think Luke is in this story answering that important question of where's Jesus? Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the Beautiful Gate, to ask alms for those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. Peter directed his gaze at him as to John and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold. Though what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. 
And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Where's Jesus? Well, I think in that moment, he's rather clearly seen in his friend, disciple, and apostle, Peter. Where's Jesus? I think we've already begun to see him in the people that he has gathered around him, in that glad and generous fellowship of the breaking of bread and the devotion to the apostles' teaching and, and all of those things that, that Luke has already told us about. Where's Jesus? I think he's in his people. I think this day, if you want to ask, well, where's Christ? You don't point up. You point to that person who is speaking his word to you, who is forgiving you in his name, who is loving you with that love of Christ, who is feeding you if you're hungry or clothing you if you have not enough to wear, who is, who is being Jesus to you. There's Jesus. He has many faces. He has many hands. He speaks with many different voices and many different ranges. But he speaks, he acts, and he does things. I've always found it interesting that, you know, the, the hospitals in <coughs> Portland are for the most part named after religious institutions. Uh, my wife works at Good Samaritan, but some of us go to Providence, and others of us go to, to could go to, to Peace Health, or to, to St. Vincent's, or to uh, Adventist Hospital. Yes, there's OHSU, and there's Kaiser, and there's those others, but those are actually more recent. The older hospitals, the, the, the places that have been here for a long time, were often started by Christians, started by, by Christian people who said, Jesus lives in me. Therefore, as I saw Jesus care for the sick in his day, I should care for the sick in my day. And so they opened a hospital. Now, running medical facilities these days has grown far more complicated. Some of them have become secular institutions. But they were started. They were started because God's people wanted to do what Jesus does. If you are hungry in Portland these days, there's a very good chance that the entity which hands you something to eat will have a cross on top of its building. Because Jesus, in the wilderness, fed the multitudes. This isn't all positive. Peter, at the end of this, has a sermon that he preaches again. Brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance and did as your rulers, as did also your rulers. But what God forced, foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer and he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. The times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you, and it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaim these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your father, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. And as they were speaking, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed, because they were teaching the people. God's people will also be found 
suffering like Jesus, facing enmity and facing those who will, who will resist and rise up and persecute. Where's Jesus? We find him in God's people, sometimes persecuted, sometimes loving, caring, sometimes being the people who have something to eat and share. Where do you see Jesus today? Where do you find him in this world? You might look no farther than your spouse, your, 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 your friend, a son, a daughter, a parent. You might look no farther than a neighbor. You might even see him in the mirror. Look for him. I pray you see him soon.